Welcome, listener, to another edition of the Comic Relief Podcast. I am your host, Michael Moreno, and with me, as always, are Thomas and Amy Logue. How are you guys doing today? Doing good, sir. Doing good. Excellent. So before we get into this amazing uh, season two wrap-up of The Mandalorian, um, we have a sort of a somber announcement, huh? Yeah, so actor Jeremy Bullock, who originally played Boba Fett in The Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi, has passed away this past Thursday. Um, not long ago, David Prowse, who played Vader, also had recently passed, so it's it's been a rough year for Star Wars. Jeremy Bullock had battled Parkinson's disease for quite a few years. Um, he had a long and happy career spanning more than 45 years. He was a, devoted to his wife, three sons, and ten grandchildren, and they will miss him terribly a statement said. Bullock was best known for playing the bounty hunter Boba Fett in The Empire Strikes Back and briefly in The Return of the Jedi. Rest in peace, Jeremy Bullock. And speaking of Mandalorians and Boba Fett, let's talk about The Mandalorian. What a, what a strange sort of ironic twist that he passed in between episodes of The Mandalorian that that just brought Boba Fett back into the, the lexicon. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, and uh, his legacy will definitely carry on for many more years to come. And now it's even more assured. Yep. And before we continue on to, um, to The Mandalorian discussion, we just want to let you know that there will be many Many, 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 many. So much spoilers. <laughs> but before we get into the season finale, though, we I keep doing this whole before being before, 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 before. <laughs> uh, we have not yet discussed the episode before the season finale, the one where we got the uh, uh, the Bill Burr character back. What did you guys think of this episode now? I call it the shipment episode because that was the majority of it where they're driving in that van with the highly volatile uh, stuff. Uh, just to finish it off, Din Djarin has to find out where uh, uh, he has to find the location of Mock Gideon. So he has to access an Imperial terminal. And in order to do that, he needs Bill Burr's character, who I forget his name, unfortunately. And they need to take him. They need to break him out of the scrapyard. Recruits Cara Dune because she is now a New Republic marshal to go take him out of the, the scrapyard. Bill Burr's awesome in this, right? He's super wary. He's like, ah, what do you guys want? I don't, you don't know, right? They go to the planet. They, they basically they do the classic Star Wars um, steal st stealing the armor of a stormtrooper <laughs> to disguise themselves and infiltrate their, you know, the base or wherever they're going to. They break into the facility. They access the terminal. Uh, they find out uh, Moff Gideon's location and they fly out. Let's dig into this one just a little bit before we get into the meat and potatoes of the finale. What did you guys think of the second to last episode with the shipment? I felt like the first time, well, this is probably the first time in forever for me, at least, that like I'm actually like rooting for the bad guys, right? Because they're pretending to be bad guys and and then all of a sudden they get out of it i mean this is the same episode right because like tom i'm so in love with the last episode that i'm kind of forgetting the second to last yes. episode <laughs> but i really i did i did really like i mean i i enjoyed this episode like we talked about before like i feel like this has really gotten us back to like where star wars was before when we were um really like enchanted by it it felt star warsy it, it felt like it wasn't trying too hard because i feel like a lot of the stuff that's come out in the last whatever years was just trying really hard to like re like vamp the franchise and it didn't feel authentic. And I really did like the fact at the end that like she kind of just let him go. Cheering for the Empire is such a strange thing, but it was it was real. And this show does that so often. When the TIE fighters show up and save the day, you're you're cheering for the Empire. And then they get back to the base and all the, the stormtroopers and all the Imperial for troopers are all like cheering and they got their arms in the air and you're just like, yeah, they did <laughs> yeah, I feel good for these guys. Like the Empire finally got a win. Granted, it took <laughs> non-imperial team to do it for them, but they finally got a win. These poor guys. They, they've had a they've had a rough go at it <laughs> since the original trilogy. One of my favorite parts of that episode was when they, you know, they've made it through, they go, they need to get the code from the console. And the one guy who was the commander at that table. And he calls him over and, you know, he's like, oh, you know, any price for the victory of the Empire? And that dude was like, yeah, some prices are too high. <laughs> I was like, hell yeah, because they really quick, they built up my ability to hate that commander guy. <laughs> what a great actor, by the way. That guy played the um, the Ice King in Game of Thrones. The Night King from Game of Thrones, from the White Walkers. What a great 
actor, man. They couldn't have picked a, a, such a, you know what that was a little reminiscent of? I, I felt like, because, uh, you know, he he had sort of a, a Southern accent, a really like sort of a gnarly Southern accent. And he was kind of a, uh, his attitude to me seemed like he was like an ex-Confederate soldier. Yes. Right? That even though they'd, they, like they, they'd already lost, but they were still out there sort of just digging their heels in and being like, well, it is what it is, man. We had to do what we had to do. And then for this guy to just come up and just shrug his shoulders and hand him a shot and be like, yeah, well, such a great like uh, character building point for me. Like they, 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 again, the show does that really well, where even though you don't see these characters for very long, you get so much, you know, it's it, Bill Burr's could have been just a throwaway character. Bill Burr's character had a really hard time sort of wrapping his head around the people that he used to work for maybe aren't the good guys. And there was it, there was a lot of that, too, because it, it all he also had that conversation while they were driving around in the uh, in the tank with Mando, where he was like, look, man, you think you're the good guy, but these guys think they're the good guys. And, you know, we just put on our helmets and just, you know, do what we have to do. And I thought that was a really good conversation too. And then as Mando sort of looking out the window, he sees like the kids, right? The locals looking up. One thing that I thought was interesting, and I, I would have to go back and double check when he's looking at the villagers, they only show females and children. And yep. I thought, oh, like all the uh, like all the adult males are like slaves or something like that. But it turns out apparently all the adult males were the quote unquote pirates. I like that they, yeah. they call them pirates. To the Empire, they're pirates. They're pirates, yep. They're, they're locals. The Empire is invading on their land. It's funny, because normally it seems like those are the type of people Mando would have, have somehow ended up helping. Like, I was honestly waiting at some point for him to somehow have a turnaround and help these people. Yep. But he was actually forced to kill them, you know, as they're trying to blow up the, the cart he's driving, because they don't know. You know, they don't know yeah. his end plan, but he's forced to kill a bunch of these dudes. Yeah, and, and if you noticed in the episode, these dudes are trying to save each other like we're so used to seeing stormtroopers just sort of like go down like one like fall like dominoes these guys were trying to help each other from falling off the car they knew each other they were friends they were they were locals they were villagers they were brothers i thought they did that really well yeah i don't know it was a really interesting episode i i, I enjoyed it i agree <laughs> what i thought was really really funny is at the very end of that episode uh the part where they're like you know it'd be a shame if he died during this mission and he's like what <laughs> <laughs> and they do this whole thing, but what was funny is they let him go on this planet with no weapons where yeah. he's wanted by the Empire. <laughs> yeah. Like, they, they know who did it, and we're just going to leave you on this planet with no weapon to defend yourself, but at least you're free. <laughs> I was like, at, le at least toss the quote-unquote dead guy a weapon. <laughs> he had he had no bones about it either. He was like, all right, you sure? Bilber was yeah. really good in this episode. He was. He was. Really good. Bilber really, he was really endearing, man, when, when after he killed that general dude, that he was like, hey, don't worry, I won't tell anyone I saw your face. And he, yeah. he, he you could tell, like, he, he meant it. I think Bill Burr stole this episode. He was he 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 was amazing. When Boba shows up at the shipyard and he's like, oh, I thought it was the other guy. I thought it was someone else. <laughs> anyway, I wonder how much of the stuff they let him just sort of um, sort Wait. of mad lib. All right. Anything else on this? You guys want to touch on this episode before we jump into? To the season finale of season two with the Mandalorian. Oh, <laughs> oh my God, Becky. <laughs> I, you know, it's funny because, okay, how did the episode... Start. That's the hard part to remember. <laughs> that is the hard part. Yeah, I don't remember. How did it start? It was. It was. They had. They were with Bo-Katan. Yeah, they went to go get Bo-Katan and the other girl who I can't stand. So the scene, <laughs> the, the cantina scene, where they were talking to, um, yeah, they were sort of giving Boba uh, Boba Fett a hard time, where they were like, "You're not a Mandalorian." He's like, "I never said I was." So when they say he's not a Mandalorian, it's because he's not quote unquote a real boy because he's a clone yeah mm -hmm. but that was a really good scene it was good fight scene too i like when um it, it wasn't bo katan bo -Katan was just watching yeah the, the other, other girl one. she did the um the spin with the jetpack around him that was a good fight the only part i didn't like about the fight was the very end where they both flame torch each other and but neither of them are really being burned like somehow the flame torches are canceling each other out in the middle i don't think that's how fire works like the fire was literally very like cartoon like yeah. stopping in the middle you know like when one person shoots a beam another sh person shoots the beam and they hit yeah. in the middle and yeah. they're trying to push the beam one side or the other that's exactly what the fire did it just kind of stopped in between them 
Well, that was kind of a lame end for me to that fight because everything up to that was awesome. Yeah, I, I feel like that fire thing, though, might be a nod to Dave Filoni's past on Avatar The Last Airbender because firebenders would do that. You know, when you oh, see firebenders and they blast at each other, the flames would just meet in the middle. And what happens next, Amy? Oh, my gosh. I don't even... <laughs> <laughs> Good job. Amy, I'm just Amy's wow. like, so then they're on the ship. <laughs> <laughs> Can we just fast forward to the ship? So what they were gonna do is they were gonna fake that the Lambda Cruiser was being under was coming under attack by the Slave One. Right. And they plugged the uh the chute that the TIE fighters come out of with the Lambda Cruiser so that no more TIE fighters can come out. They just let Boba do what Boba does and just wreck the TIE fighters. When his turrets on the top flip to shoot behind him. I was like, oh. Dude, my, my slave one moment was when you could see the cockpit rotating. Because I always oh, wondered, so like, good. when when Boba and Django get in the ship, are they laying back? <laughs> are they just staring <laughs> at the sky? They have, they have like, a gyroscope <laughs> cockpit, yeah. which is like, oh, cool. Thank you. The Lambda Cruiser ha- is the Trojan horse. It has all the girl power team, which, dude, what yep. a I- why? I like the scene where they go, uh, they, they go across the catwalk, and then the That's two Mandalorians yep. fall off the side. Yeah, and then they start they, they start fighting. You know, the the the, the, the I think it was Cara Dune and um I forget the assassin's name. The sniper is what the I sniper. call it. Yeah, yeah, the sniper. Uh, they're still there's now they're sort of uh, flanked on both sides. You know, from the front and the rear, and then of course the the Mandalorians rocket back up and just start wailing on them other than when we get towards the end i think that was probably my favorite scene but uh, i was gonna say if, if i were putting together a uh turn-based rpg team with these characters like that would definitely be uh my four-man squad right there i would add brianna tarth on the side i'm also watching the final season of game of thrones which i hadn't seen and brianna tarth is awesome mando stays behind on the Lambda Cruiser, right? That's plugging up the, the the TIE fighter hole. He sets out to go find the child. Keep in mind, it was also Mando's job to stop the um, Dark Troopers or whatever oh, they're called. the Dark Troopers, yeah. yeah. On the way to go get the child to stop them. Moff Gideon's cruiser is running on a skeleton crew, but they have something, what was it, like 20, 15 to 25 Dark Troopers. He had a, what was it, like a minute or something to stop them from booting up and just mm-hmm. to, to lock them away. Yeah. Right? Real quick, I want to just add the whole reason that bo agrees to help is that she gets to keep the dark saber dark saber and the ship to retake mandalore i have a feeling that will be important later we're we're gonna get into that in a second (laughs) but mando's on his way to go seal the door on the um on the dark trooper it's there just in time like one dark trooper gets out yeah, how the doors that? close but one of them gets his hand through one of them gets through how great was that scene man between <laughs> dark trooper and mando you mean where it pummels mando through a wall yeah. <laughs> that part he was so out of his league yeah i mean he used every weapon in his arsenal he used his flamethrower he used his little dart things that fly out i, I like that scene served so many different sort of elements it sets up how strong these dark troopers are right and he gets pummeled i love the scene where he's just getting punched into the wall until he took out his veskar staff yeah the spear thing yeah the spear so it was satisfying to see him just totally wreck this dark trooper with the spear and then i thought well okay that would be the resolution to the episode was he's just going to take a spear and go ham on all these troopers and then he just opens the vacuum door <laughs> <laughs> this time around though they're not living creatures and oh yeah they have rocket feet which we saw in again the episode where they kidnapped the um the child just fyi and i don't remember if bogotan leads mando to where the child is no um mando he just he knows in. the way yeah, yeah. And he ah. sees that um, Moff Gideon basically has the dark saber to the child. What a great scene. So Moff Gideon is a very smart individual. He knows that if he loses the dark saber, if he loses the fight to Mando and Mando takes the dark saber, that will pit bo against Mando. Oh, another thing that Moff Gideon said that was uh, very telling and again for the audience was he said, just assume that I know everything. Spoilers, uh, Mando defeats Moff Gideon. Uh, I mean, after going up against the Dark Trooper, I feel like Moff Gideon was probably a, a nice cool down workout. <laughs> he was not getting his head pummeled into the bulkhead. He has Moff Gideon captive, right? Because uh, Cara Dune wants him alive. Bogatan wants the ship 
and wants uh, the dark saber. Once they get to the bridge, there's this moment of realization. Moff Gideon sort of has this. If he, I felt like if he had um, a twirly mustache, would have he would have been twirling his mustache in that scene where he sort of <laughs> chuckles and he's like, "You fool! You fell right into my plan." You know? Do you guys understand the sort of the meaning behind the dark saber and and and? why Bo-Katan can't take it back. Tell us why, Tom. I want your take on it. So after Mando brings in Moff Gideon and he's like, here you go, here's the dark saber. And he starts chuckling and laughing and saying, yeah, she won't take it. She can't take it. It has to be won in combat. And so he says, okay, fine. I surrender. Take it. And he says, no, 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 because it's about the story of the dark saber. That is what's important. And that whoever has the dark saber will rule over Mandalore. I'm sorry. I'm just trying to remember if, if Moff Gideon dies. He tries. <laughs> yeah. Like a so, so you remember when they came into the bridge, they fought a bunch of dudes and knocked him out. Moff Gideon landed when he was thrown. He landed next to a gun. I noticed that and kind of threw his, his cape over it to hide the gun. So then when he stands up to basically first, oh, right, right, once right. he realizes someone's coming, he tries to kill the child. Mando jumps in front of him, and then he puts the blaster to his head. But yeah. I can't remember who it is, but someone stops him from yeah, it was, pulling it was, that uh, trigger. A Disney executive came in and knocked it out of his hand. We can't sell if you if you die. <laughs> Don't board. you listen to the podcast? <laughs> so Mo- Moff Gideon was the last owner of the dark saber, correct? And then Mando mm-hmm. won it, but Mando didn't kill him. Yeah, it might have not been to the death, but I think it has to be in combat. Uh, if you watch the, um, I believe it's, I, I'm sorry, I get Rebels and Clone Wars mixed up because I saw them out of order. But the way that bo first got, because bo used to have the Darksaber. Her sister Sabine found the Darksaber and handed it to her because she, you know, everyone felt that she was the rightful ruler of Mandalore. She's already been given, it's already been given to her once. And she somehow lost it to Moff Gideon. And then for it to be given to her a second time without her earning it, it's too much. Oh. They say, oh yeah, I remember she got it and then she lost it and then she got it back again. And well, who did she defeat? Oh no, uh, this other guy uh, defeated and then just yielded it to her. It's 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 not going to rally the Mandalorians to her side. Right. So now we've got everyone's in the cockpit. The bridge, yeah. This is when it happens or? Yes. Mm-hmm. You remember they say, hey, we have small objects coming back towards us. And they realize it's the dark troopers because as Michael said, they have jets. They don't need to breathe. They can just fly right back into the ship. Close the blast door. They close it. But then the two in the front just start hammering away in a rhythmic beat on the door and you can see from the other side of the blast door where they're inside the bridge that it is putting a dent in the blast door and that they are going to get through and Moff Gideon says you might as well realize once I get through everyone in this room is going to be dead except for me and things, things look, look pretty, pretty hopeless, hopeless for our heroes and then that's the end of the episode so anyway <laughs> <laughs> yeah and it fades to black <laughs> that would have been awful. You see a single X-Wing fighter. Who can it be? You know, at first I was like, oh, obviously, right? I'm sure everybody else also thought it was Luke. But then I was like, maybe, hmm. Started thinking maybe it could be Ezra, possibly Ezra. <laughs> That's um, so funny. That's what I said. And then once you see like the cloaked figure come out, I was like, well, now I know who it is because that made it very clear. I mean, I saw the cloaked figure and I was like, oh, oh, oh. And then the green saber pops out and I was like, oh, yeah. How good was that friggin' scene of just Luke chomping through all these droids? I think, so that was awesome. But I think my favorite one is, it was right near the tail end of him chopping through him. He gets to that one, just extends his hand and closes his hand. Um, And you see the robot just start collapsing into itself. And I was like, oh, that is so good. Yes. Didn't you feel that it was, that the scene was... uh, reminiscent of the Darth Vader scene in the uh, Rogue One. It's something that Amy had mentioned um, uh, on a phone call. She said that she she didn't know that the Jedi actually did those like crushing force choke type moves. Like, how do you, how do you, what do you feel about that before I get my opinion? To know your enemy, you have to also have their power, understand their power. I think the Jedi, however, don't use it against a living being ever, but I could certainly see them using it against a robot because they're not destroying a life. They're just putting a machine down. What do you think, Amy? Is that a decent enough explanation or are you still upset that Luke force crushed a droid? 
upset by it. It just, well, obviously coming off of where he had just come from, their Jedi ended, right? Because it's after Jedi. But mm-hmm. at the same time, he's got a lot of new harness powers that he's just learning how to use. I mean, because at the end of the day, the child is going to learn from Luke's yeah. way of teaching the Force. Because there's not that many Jedis left, right? So it's yeah. kind of like, it's interesting how it started out um, with a bunch of Jedis and masters and everything. And then the way that the series has turned, it really, a lot of it is put on Luke's shoulders, yep. which is very strange when you think about it throughout the whole thing, because if people are big Star Wars fans, um, everyone's mm. always kind of like, oh my God, Luke's so whiny. He's so this. I mean, he's never been like, no one's, I mean, I don't say no one, but like no one's ever been like, oh my God, who's your favorite character in Star Wars? Luke. You know, like it's not like he's the go-to, you know, of favorite yeah. characters. Well, we, we obviously so. hang around different circles as there are <laughs> plenty of people, I think, that like Luke. So there's there's Luke from the movies and there's Luke from the extended universe. And the Luke of the extended universe is, he's considered to be one of the greatest Jedi to ever live. We've never yeah. seen that. Yeah. popular media you know what what this show does they did this for boba fett and they're doing it for luke so for years people have claimed that these two characters some of the the coolest baddest characters that we just have never seen do their thing now we see where luke is at we've seen what boba fett can do uh we hadn't seen that in the movies i always kind of felt boba fett got a lot of props for not having very much face time <laughs> in movies every guy i think i've i've ran into who's like Star Wars or buyers that I've worked at with um, stores and stuff like that. Like, mm-hmm. I'm always like, what's your favorite like character? And, you know, I would say two out of three times it would always be Boba Fett. But when you really look at it, you're like, well, how much time did he really get on screen? Like, None. is it because he's a bounty hunter? I'm like, is it because yeah. he got eight in a Sarlacc pit? Like, I mean, like, I, I never really kind of got it. I mean, I think uh, it's because he looks cool and everyone liked the slave one. Pretty much it. He just, he had the look and it was like yeah. one or two points about how awesome he was. That's all it took. It's funny because it's fan service, but it's fan service done so well. They managed to squeeze in fan service in a way that, that is relevant to the story and moves the story along perfectly. It makes sense that Luke would answer the call from the child. He's out there looking for Jedi. He's out there recruiting. He's scouring the galaxy. And there aren't many Jedi. So if if a if a beacon goes out, if a help beacon goes out, he's it's probably gonna be Luke that answers it. Okay, just to finish off, Luke just destroys these dark troopers in such a satisfying way. So now we get to a point where Mando's found a Jedi to train. But right away he's like, yeah, he doesn't want to go with you. I love how well this show handled this transition this scene this transaction where he's like he's waiting for your permission then jaron looks over and he's like oh man you're right i'm his dad and that scene where he pulls the hood back and they have the you know the interaction and the child and din jaron and i i I teared up a little bit man a little bit oh for sure especially when he takes off his helmet very reminiscent right of when Darth Vader dies and he asked Luke to take off his mask so he could see his face. I mean, it was very um, like a callback to that a little bit, you know? Well, that's actually like, a good point. Great. I hadn't even thought of that. Great point. You know, the father taking off the helmet to show the son the face and everything. Like that was, yeah, you're right. How great was that Luke was just so... He just was like such a calming force. He's he felt wise. He felt like a Jedi. And how cute was it when RT saw Goku? Because oh. I mean, because you know he was at the the temple, and they were in the temple probably together. So he probably knew him because he was so excited. Yeah, they knew each other. They they all they both um, waddled at each other like you know their, their little waddling thing that they do. That was kind of cool. He was like, oh, God, I'm so happy you're not C-3PO and whiny. <laughs> and then all was so, right with the nerdverse. I have an interesting question before we jump to anything past that. Now that they have gotten rid of Baby Yoda, right? He's off with Luke because now Boba Fett has paid his debt. They've got the child back. So Boba Fett does not have to hang around anymore. So it seems like they're gearing Mando to go with bo to maybe go help take Mandalore back. I am curious if there is going to be a drop in viewership because there is no more Baby Yoda. There are the hardcore fans that are going to keep watching it, right? But there are a bunch of children, you know, and a bunch of women, even a bunch of boys who literally only watched it 
because of Baby Yoda. And now they've taken out the cute element of the Mandalorian. So I'm curious if there is going to be some kind of drop in viewership. It's, I mean, obviously it's not going to be enormous, but I, I would be curious to see the, the viewership of season three versus season one and two. My prediction for this show is it's going to take a hard turn because they obviously we're going to talk about like how like there was that end scene right after the yes. credits, right? And what happens there, and Boba takes over, and we can go into more depth about it. I feel like the Mandalorian's going to take a hard turn, and it's going to be front-facing Boba Fett, because they said that it's coming back December 2021, and Kathleen Kennedy had already said that Mandalorian 3 is coming back December 2021. Mm -hmm. And I'm a little suspicious to see if they would actually play both at the same, for me at least, they would kind of like pace it out differently. So I don't know where Mando is going to end up. I don't know where Baby Yoda is going to end up, but I have a feeling that maybe Mandalorian 3 is going to be Boba Fett. Well, I thought the way I, I, so let's just talk about that ending where we see Jabba's palace. We see the sniper walking in there. She's kind of walking and Bib Fortuna has taken over Jabba's slot. He has gained a bunch of weight. That was Bib? So he, I thought that was uh, 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 Jabba Jr., man. He's, he got big. I know. He got big. He got, he got big. I mean, it's, it's a, a lush journey, life man. he took over. And then we see one of the Gamorrean guards run up. Boo! Get shot. Another one starts running up. Boo! Get shot. We see Boba Fett's shadow, and then we see Boba Fett. And then Bit Fortuna said something. Yeah, oh, Boba Fett. <laughs> I thought you were dead. It's like, are you hungry? Yeah. I have some food. <laughs> <laughs> you want to eat? Boba Fett proceeds to shoot him and kill him and sits on the throne. Now he's kind of like overseas the underworld. Yeah, the yeah. underworld, the shadow market. My impression of when we see at the very end, he's sitting on the throne, and it says, Bo the book of Boba Fett, December 2021. To me, I thought that was indicating a new show, a separate show that would focus on Boba Fett. Because what Disney could easily do is the Book of Boba Fett comes out on Monday. Mandalorian comes out on Friday. So you're still making it so it's two separate shows or not directly competing. At the end of our um, last podcast for The Mandalorian, we got into a conversation about Mandalorian Season 3 and then the Book of Boba Fett. Mm -hmm. So I was... Um, looking up stuff and I came upon a tweet from Paul Bateman who basically is the um, concept designer and art director for um, The Mandalorian and he works for uh, Disney and it's kind of a long paragraph but basically what he's saying is that Twitter's making a tangle out of confusion and I just wanted to he goes I don't officially represent Lucasfilms but I but what I do comes with, with things like this and he says at all I'm reassuring a few worried folk that the book of Boba Fett and the Mandalorian season three will appear to have entirely different shooting schedules despite potentially releasing around the same time so it has been confirmed uh, to sign on for the third season consequently and is very understandable conclusion to reach we were talking about the same show but they're two entirely different shows but then he says but then it's still 2020 and I suppose anything can happen so my theory was wrong. And, the, and they've also confirmed that the all these shows are going to culminate into a Defenders type show. There's going to be the threat of uh, something much bigger. I suspect it's going to be Thrawn. I, I suspect yeah. that the story is going to go into the Thrawn story with Bo-Katan and Ahsoka. Because what if they do find, they finally get to Thrawn and like the season finale reveal is, or they finally get to Ezra and the season finale reveal of that season is that He's a dark Jedi. Anyways, I'm you know, I'm tapped out. That was a great season. That was an excellent season of the uh, the Mandalorian. Thanks everyone for joining us on this uh, wrap up of the Mandalorian season two. Thomas, uh, please let us know where can we find the Comic Relief Podcast. All right, you can find us on www.comicreliefpodcast.com. You can go to facebook.com forward slash Comic Relief Podcast. You can go to twitter.com forward slash Comic Relief Pod C. And there's also an Instagram, which is Instagram.com forward slash Comic Relief Pod C. The outro will correct any mistakes I may have just made as to where you can find us. Thomas, Michael, and Amy will return in the next episode of the Comic Relief Podcast. How about uh, we go out on a moment of silence for uh, Mr. Jeremy Bullock and uh, in remembrance of his great work 
and his great life.